In Sex at Dawn, my wife and co-author Casilda Jetta and I look at four major areas of data to try to triangulate what our species' sexual nature really is and, and what our sexual evolution was all about. We look at primates, particularly the chimps and bonobos, who are as closely related to humans or, or more closely related to humans than the Indian elephant is to the African elephant, for example. Extremely close. We had a last common ancestor about five or six million years ago, which is the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms. We also look at anthropology, particularly hunter-gatherer societies that live in ways that replicate the way our ancestors lived before agriculture. We look at human anatomy and physiology, so the body, why are the testicles outside of the body, why do women have pendulous breasts, what's going on with the acidity of the female reproductive tract uh, during orgasm, all these sorts of issues, what's the chemistry of uh, different spurts of uh, ejaculate in men. And finally, we look at uh, contemporary psychosexual research, so things like um, what sorts of Sexual issues do um, couples often present with at a therapist's office? What sorts of um, sexual obsessions do people have? What sorts of uh, pornography turn people on or, or not? So when you look at the question of human sexual evolution and human sexual nature from those four different perspectives, you see a species that has evolved to be extremely sexual, where sexual behavior has been co-opted over the course of our evolutionary history for social functions. It's not even primarily about reproduction anymore. For human beings, sex is primarily about establishing and maintaining complex social networks that are based upon trust and intimacy. That's what sex is really mainly about for our species. You can just look at the numbers. The way the numbers break down are that, uh, you know, for most mammals, they only have sex when the female's ovulating, which makes sense. Why would you have sex if there's no chance of pregnancy happening, right? For most mammals, uh, sex is risky. There are predators around. You're making noise. You're not being vigilant. You're, you're preoccupied with something else. You're very distracted. You could fall out of a tree. You could get uh, bit by a snake. You could have ants crawl up your butt. All sorts of terrible things could happen. So you're not going to engage in sexual activity unless there's something to be gained, something that's worth taking that risk and uh, using that energy. But for human beings, we have sex when the female's not ovulating. We have same-sex encounters. We have sex when the female's already pregnant. We have sex when she's postmenopausal, when she's lactating and therefore not ovulating. We have all sorts of uh, sexual configurations and activities that can't possibly result in pregnancy. That's pretty unusual for most mammals. Uh, if you look at gorillas, for example, which are the next closest primate relative after chimps and bonobos, gorillas have sex roughly 12 to 15 times per birth. That's a pretty typical ratio of sex acts to birth for, or to conception for mammals. For humans, it's somewhere up around 800 to 1,000 times per birth. We're way off the charts. People who say we describe humans in ways that make us seem like animals are getting it backwards. Animals rarely have sex for non-reproductive purposes. The only exceptions to this are chimps, bonobos, humans, very closely related, and dolphins, which is very interesting. All of those are highly social, highly intelligent animals for whom the social network is crucial to their survival. Just among primates, there are over 300 species of primate. Many, many species of primate live in complex social groups, which means more than one adult male living in that group. Of those primates living in complex social groups, precisely none are sexually monogamous, unless you believe that humans are the sole exception to that. In Sex at Dawn, we argue against what we call the standard narrative of human sexual evolution, which claims that humans evolved as monogamous couples where the woman was trading her fidelity to the male in exchange for meat, uh, protection, shelter, status, and so on. This argument, which goes back to Darwin and, and beyond in some ways, really is insulting to everybody. It, it basically is an economic argument that reduces women to whores and men to johns, paying for sex with stuff. We argue that this is a, a result of what we call Flintstoneization, which is the habit we all have of looking at the world around us, assuming that that's pretty much always the way it's been, and then projecting 
contemporary conditions into prehistory and just rough up the edges a little bit. So, uh, you know, the Flintstones, people have cars, but you have to make the car run with your feet instead of an engine. You know, you've got the doorbell, but it's a bird. You pull the tail and so on. And we think that similar things happen in a lot of the discussion about human prehistory. It makes no sense to assume that humans evolved in nuclear family units. That's not how hunter-gatherers live today. That's not how any hunter-gatherer society that's ever been studied lives, with discrete nuclear family dwellings where resources are only shared within the family. In fact, what we find in hunter-gatherer societies is that resources are shared widely. Children are raised communally. Food is shared, especially meat is shared uh, widely. Women have a very high status. They bring home more of the calories than the men do. So there's no reason to believe that men were in a position to coerce women and control their sexuality. This didn't happen until the advent of agriculture. If you look at the Old Testament, it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Read it in context and you'll see that's not talking about his marriage. That's talking about his possessions. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his house, nor his ox, nor his slaves, etc. The wife is just another one of his possessions. That's not how hunter-gatherers see relationships. That's not how hunter-gatherers see women or children. These people aren't owned by other people. In fact, there's very little sense of private property in hunter-gatherer societies. So what we're arguing in Sex at Dawn is that sexual pleasure was part of the larger social fabric in which pretty much everything is shared widely. This is the way our species has dealt with sexuality for the vast majority of its time on this planet. The sorts of possessiveness and, and coercion that we see today are relatively recent aberrations in human social organization. All this naturally leads to the question, well, what does this mean for me? What does this mean for marriage? What does this mean for my relationship? Honestly, it doesn't really mean much in terms of uh, how you should behave. What it tells us is that it's natural to feel certain things. It's natural to have desires for other people. Uh, there's no way to avoid that for most human beings. And we shouldn't beat ourselves up about that. And we shouldn't uh, uh, take those desires as an indictment of our relationship. The fact that your partner and you are both attracted to other people doesn't mean there's something wrong with your relationship or there's something wrong with your partner or there's something wrong with you. All it means is that you're human beings. So let's all relax a little bit and accept that that's the baseline. That's the kind of animal we are. Now, what we choose to do with that information is completely up to us. This information is no more an indictment of monogamy than it's an indictment of uh, vegetarianism to say that we're omnivores. Look at us. We're omnivores. Look at the, the chimps and the bonobos and the other primates who are similar to us genetically. They're also omnivores. Their teeth are like ours. Their, their saliva chemistry is like ours. Their digestive system is like ours. So we look at all that information and we say, well, okay, we've also evolved to be omnivores. That doesn't mean you can't be a vegetarian. Of course you can. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with being a vegetarian. That could be a superior way for you to live. It could be great for your health. It could be great for your pocket book. It could be ethically superior. That's completely up to you. All I'm saying is just because you've decided to be a vegetarian doesn't mean that suddenly bacon stops smelling good. It's still going to smell good. You're still going to be tempted because of the animal that you are. And you're going to be more successful in controlling your behavior and designing your relationships the way you want them to be if you're open and honest and you acknowledge that this is the kind of animal that we are. This is the kind of animal you're forming your relationship with. Start from that. Start from an accurate expectation of what sort of creature you are, and you'll have much more success in trying to control your behavior and shape your relationship in ways that make sense for you.